With a closer look at our new CBS poll, we're joined by our executive director of elections and surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, great to have you here. Good to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we have seen in your polling of the popular vote that this is neck and neck. As we know, it comes down to the magic 270, the electoral count, and those battleground states that have those hefty electoral votes with them are, are really what are being focused on by the campaigns. In your numbers, those are also dead even. Yep, this is as tight as all of this has ever been. Big picture, the national vote is everyone's voice, of course, and that all counts. But in that race to 270 for electoral votes, it's going to come down to a handful, we think, seven battleground states. Across them, it is exactly even. Hasn't really moved much over the course of this campaign. The individual states themselves are all close. I do think it's curious, this year more than others, the national vote is tracking very closely with those battleground states. It could mean we've just got a very nationalized election here. You have, through this election, particularly since Vice President Harris moved to the top of the ticket, talked about the divide along gender lines. What are you hearing from voters? So that gender gap, which is now in our polling the largest we've seen yet this year, is driven by a couple of things, I think, starting with people's views on larger societal factors. We ask people, what do you think about U.S. efforts to promote more gender equality? When people say those efforts they believe have gone too far, and that's a little more men who say that, they're voting overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. When people say those efforts haven't gone far enough, and many women say that, they're voting overwhelmingly for Kamala Harris. Those numbers are pretty stark. They really are, and it's one of the biggest splits in the election. It's a reminder that the gender gap isn't just a crosstab on a poll report. It's people expressing views about the candidates as well as the larger direction of society, frankly. And then the other part of this is when they do evaluate the candidates, you see some differences. For example, you see more men saying they believe Donald Trump would be a strong leader Mm -hmm. Although when you ask them, they say it's not necessarily because he's a man. But at the same time, look at this measure we've been following all throughout this campaign, which is who has the mental and cognitive health to serve as president. Folks will recall we were tracking that when Joe Biden was the nominee and his numbers dropping on that was important. OK, now Harris has the advantage on that, and particularly among women who are much more likely to say that only she has the mental and cognitive health. So it also affects these views of the candidates as well, these splits between men and women. Which is kind of a remarkable question to begin with in and of itself. Um, but you have been talking about for a very long time the, f the huge factor the economy is or perception of the economy is for Donald Trump supporters. The Democrats are putting reproductive health care front and center. Is that bet working for them? Well, it motivates the Democratic base. And that's important because we may have a very turnout determining election here, right? But at the same time, I do notice that the number of people who say abortion is a major factor in their vote has been fairly steady throughout this campaign, hasn't really gone above the low 50 percent. And one might think that if the Democrats were getting more traction on that, 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 that those numbers would go higher. And frankly, they haven't. At the same time, on the economy, you know, Kamala Harris has been trying to separate herself from Joe Biden a little bit. And we do see in the polling more people start to say they're evaluating her on her proposals. She's cut a little bit into Donald Trump's advantage on what really is a central question. Are you better off or would you be better off financially, under which of these candidates. Trump still has the edge on that, though. She hasn't cut quite far enough in it, and so he maintains that edge for people who say that the economy is their top issue. Rhetoric has been extremely heated throughout this campaign, but both of them are now arguing the other is the threat to democracy itself. Uh, how are voters reacting? So a couple of things. One is you see each side does think the other one is a threat. Each side does think that democracy is under threat, albeit for different reasons, number one. Number two, though, you do see Donald Trump has often gotten a proportion of voters who feel that the whole system is broken. And I think that's really central to understanding part of his appeal. 
Um, so that hasn't changed much. What you do see, and you can ask people, how they want the government to work overall. And by and large, voters say they'd like the two parties to negotiate and cooperate. There are some hardcore partisans who just like their party to run everything. But there is always a component, and there is here, of people who say that they want one strong leader to cut through all of this. It happens to be a little more among younger voters, a little more among young men. Um, and we do see more of Donald Trump supporters saying that relative to Kamala Harris supporters. This, for a larger context, does happen sometimes in democracies. If you have a decline of trust in institutions, mm -hmm. which we have also seen, it's not the majority, but that view is out there. And that allows itself to have more manipulation of perception and what voters are, are, are thinking. It's a, it's a dangerous thing you just put your finger on. And, and that's why I want to, Anthony, set some expectations here on clarity. People remember days when, on election night, it was clear who the winner was. In very tight races, it's not going to be clear, and it may take some time. U.S. intelligence is warning. There are bad actors looking to manipulate how long it may take and to manipulate your mind. What expectations should we have for the vote count? Uh, the first word is patience. Um, you're right that it will take a while for all our expectations. A lot of these battleground states, it's not just that they're close. It's that they've got millions of votes to count. And especially some of the larger counties may take them late into the night. It may very well go another day, another couple of days before all those get counted. We may need to see all of those votes before we can determine who's won. So patience is the watchword here. But the other thing is, we are at CBS News going to show you how this unfolds all along. I am going to show you from the data desk where the outstanding vote is, what's been reported, what the implications of all of it are in real time, so that you can watch it unfold along with us. And I think that'll be important. You don't want to just see a few votes get reported mm -hmm. and think that's the way it's all going to go. You really have to have that patience. I would add this. Most Americans may very well cast their ballots before Election Day, right? We've got mail vote. We've got early in person. Um, that will be over the next week, Margaret, kind of the abstract art painting of the political world. People are going to see whatever they want to see in that. We don't always know exactly how those people voted. They'll look at how many older people, younger people have voted, how many registered Democrats, registered Republicans. But since 2020, there have been shifts in the people's right. decisions about how to cast their ballots. And we don't know how that will play out yet. So I urge patients there as well over the next week. And we'll have those expectations about what the early vote means once we get closer to Election Day. And we're going to speak on this program with the secretaries of state to understand how they are administering those elections and how quickly each state 